Welcome to Unit 5. Um, let's get started. When a person creates something, it becomes copyrighted, and all rights are dictated by the creator, except, of course, for fair use, which we've learned, unless the creator specifies that it can be in the public domain. Although the term public domain is commonly only used to refer to those works whose copyright has expired, can also refer to works for which the creator has forfeited all of their IP rights. However, some creators thought that this all-or-nothing approach to ownership rights needed some improvement. For example, many creators want others to build upon their work, but they still want to retain some of their rights, such as the right to attribution. Thus, the Creative Commons was created in 2001. You'll read more about Creative Commons in this week's readings. The lecture today is going to focus on licensing. Licensing is related to an IP in that people purchase a license to utilize some copyrighted item, software, music, um, ebooks. The complexities of copyright and licensing are lengthy, so let's get started. The first sale doctrine allows people who purchase a legal copy of a work to be able to lend it or sell it as they wish. This means if I buy a book from Barnes & Noble and want to donate it to the public library or to sell it on eBay, I am able to do so. Digital media, though, have introduced new complexities into the first sale doctrine. As we've learned, most software, for example, is not sold, which means that a legal copy wasn't purchased. Thus, the person in possession of the software may not lend it or sell it. Software manufacturers have characterized this transaction as paying for a license to utilize the software. Sometimes the license is tied to a specific time period, like a one-year license. Other times, though, it's an indefinite license, which could, you know, in fact, be perpetuity. However, remember, it's only a license to use. The person who is obtaining the license agrees to all the manufacturer's terms and conditions when they click the accept button to install the software. Okay. Um, a license, again, is very similar to, for example, leasing a car. Okay. You have the right to use the car. You do not have the right to give the car to anybody else or allow other people to use it. Um, generally, we've seen that the uh, click-through licensing agreements prohibit users from transferring the license or attempting to sell it. Okay? The person is just granted a license to use the software. Um, thus, this would not be able to be re resold to anyone or given to anyone, regardless of whether or not it was removed from the original computer on which it is installed. There are academic versions of software that can only be obtained by categories of people that the manufacturer delineates. Like, for example, Adobe might sell academic licenses only to instructors um, or students um, or instructors or students um, in K-12, etc. Okay? Um, the person has to prove that they indeed belong to this category of people. I purchased Adobe Creative Suite and Lightroom um, when it was available in manners other than the cloud. Um, and there were quite a few hoops that you would have to jump through. Um, I needed to provide an email address that had a .edu. Okay. I also at one point needed to show um, a schedule. Okay. Okay. Um, if you didn't do that, you may have had the software, but you were not able to open it or use it without the activation key that they would give you. Um, without the key, the software couldn't be used. Okay. So um, the academic version also, um, if, it's be, if it has the ability to be transferred, um, that is delineated in the licensing agreement, but generally no transfer is allowed. Okay. So. The license is a product that you're being given in exchange for money. The product is not the software. Another um, method of licensing that we haven't talked about that I want to cover for licensing um, is that of product design or logo licensing. Okay? This is how like your local t-shirt company can put NFL logos on their shirts and advertise them as officially licensed products. 
This is how small companies can make Disney stuffed Mickey Mouses, okay? In both cases, the owner of the copyrighted item, you know, the NFL or Disney, would grant a limited license to a company to create products with their copyrighted or trademark work for a limited time. In return, the NFL or Disney is paid by the small company for the right to use the work. Okay. The IMG College Licensing site, the URL is on the screen, contains a really practical introduction to this um, area of IP use. Um, I thought it was really interesting looking at how much each of the universities uh, would charge for licensing fees, um, as well as um, the corporate responsibility and business considerations if you are, in, um, in fact, going to buy a license. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, Ever heard of Redigi? Neither did I. Redigi was a digital music marketplace where users could sell songs that they no longer wanted, just as they sell used DVDs and CDs, and receive money in exchange. In the readings for the week, there's an explanation of all of the legal wranglings around this service. The district court ruled in favor of Capitol Records and against Redigi. The court ruled in 2013 that Redigi's program mimicked the analog resale of a copyrighted work, but that an illegal copy was made in the process, so there was infringement. Okay. In the 2013 ruling, the issue boiled down to whether or not a copy is created when the digital music file is resold. Okay. So, Attorneys for Capitol Records argued that a person would upload their file, copying it onto Redigi's server. So a copy was made, even if Redigi argued that their software erased the original file from the seller's computer after it was up, it uploaded onto Redigi's server. Okay? Um, so they were saying that um, there was more than one copy of the file available at any point in time. The argument Capital made um, was that to upload something to another server, a copy has to be made. So in this instance, um, the ghost is the original um, file. Okay? And in order to upload it to the server, okay, a copy needs to be made. After the copy is made to Redigi's servers, okay, Redigi's program would go to an, a form of digital rights management and would erase the digital file from the ghost's computer. Okay. Um, so Capital was arguing um, that because of this, a copy was made and that there was infringement on the case of Redigi. Redigi argued back to think of the file as a completed jigsaw puzzle, I quote. Redigi's service breaks apart the puzzle, the original file, moves it piece by piece and bit for bit from the seller's device to the buyer's. At no point does Redigi create, hold, or distribute a new phono record. It just moves pieces of the original file. Okay. Capital argued, because it's not possible to transfer a digital work without making a reproduction, okay, if you embody a copyrighted work in the new device, you have, in fact, reproduced it. So basically what we have was... Um, Capital Records saying that in order to um, transfer the file to Redigi, okay, um, a copy would have to be made um, of the original, and the original would still be on the um, the original purchaser's uh, computer, as well as on Redigi's server. Meaning that at one point in time there were two copies of the digital file, okay, meaning that an illegal copy was made, okay. Um, 
Grimmelman in the article this week, Redigi Digital for Sale in Star Trek, it's really interesting, says that um, all of this legal wrangling about um, is there one copy or two copies, is it the same copy, um, is it a copy, copy, okay, said whether copy A is the same as copy B, and if so, in what senses, is not a question that anyone ought to care about. Authors, publishers, readers, libraries, and everyone else with a stake in the copyright system care about who gets access to books and on what terms. All of the technological details ought to be cute irrelevancies once the basic questions are answered. Who gets to read? Who gets paid? Further, he goes on to say, First Sale's core premise is that there ought to be the same number of copies kicking around at all times. It gives the copyright owner sole and despotic dominion over the creation of new copies, but very little say after that. But in the digital world, where copying is fast, cheap, and out of control, this compromise may not be good for authors or readers. Digital first sale may sound like a user-friendly doctrine, but the technical machinery required to ensure that the seller's copy really has been deleted is indistinguishable from a pervasive digital rights management system. So what he's saying is, um, if we're indeed going to allow um, services like Redigi to be able um, to resell digital files, um, and Redigi's uh, patented um, system uh, was really, in fact, digital rights management in that it would delete the file from the um, original um, owner's computer. Now, think about that. Another a service outside, um, outside of your computer and outside of your network is going to be going into your computer and making sure um, to erase the file. So a lot of people are were objecting to, uh, do you really want uh, a service to be able to access the files on your computer um, and erase them, even in this case? So um, Gribbleman is characterizing this entire uh, system as one in which we're arguing over digital rights management, which is indeed true. In December of 2018, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the District Court's decision and ruled against Redigi. Redigi then appealed to the Supreme Court. Remember that the Supreme Court gets to pick the cases it wants to hear. Please refer to the readings to hear the result of Redigi's filing with the Supreme Court. All of this may become a moot point given that reselling songs that originally only cost 99 cents may not be economically viable, even if it is. How long will it be before people don't purchase individual songs anymore but pay for unlimited streaming of content such as you'd find on Spotify and Pandora? Advances, advances in technology right now are wreaking havoc on some of our business models. Think about, for example, how blockbuster video stores was replaced by Netflix. Let's think about a library book, perhaps a bestseller. The book gets checked out and returned repeatedly. Its physical condition deteriorates, necessitating the purchase of another copy of the book. The total number of sales that the publisher and author received revenue for was two, the original sale and the replacement copy. Now consider an ebook, a digital book. Its condition never deteriorates. Students and patrons never lose it. They're always returned on time. Suddenly, instead of selling two copies over four years, for example, the publisher only sells one. Hmm, the publisher would be losing money. Does that sound like it's too small of a quantity to matter? Well, let's think in, in real life. A high school, for example, may purchase 350 copies of The Great Gatsby for the students to read in English class, okay? and they check them out to the students. Okay. At the end of the semester, only 300 of them are returned in any decent condition. Okay. So, for the next year, the school has to buy 50 more copies to replace the copies that were not returned or were damaged. 
in digital world, that doesn't ever happen. So instead of being able to sell an additional 50 books each year, the publisher is able to sell zero each year. So publishers had to think of a way to limit this transferring and lending of ebooks. Okay, for libraries, they had to come up with a solution because they wanted libraries to purchase ebooks, obviously, uh, for the revenue, um, and libraries are in the business to lend books. So they came up with a couple of ingenious little plans here. The first is if you take a look at the current bestseller, The President is Missing, um, the ebook version of it that a library could buy is $90. Consider that um, a hardback copy of that, I believe it's 20, probably less if you get it via Amazon or one of the big box stores or Sam's Club or Costco. Okay, so the cost of the book in digital version is four times as much as the cost of the printed copy. Okay, therefore the publisher makes more money. Okay, um, another way that they've They've, um, the publishers have controlled um, the distribution of ebooks is to sell um, copies of the book for a certain number of checkouts. For example, um, a book may only be borrowed or lent to 10 patrons over a book's lifetime. So after the library's copy of Where the Red Fern Grows is checked out 10 times, it in essence essentially self destructs. Um, it is as if the book wasn't returned by the person or it was damaged or was taken out of circulation. So the publisher has determined the time period before obsolescence and guaranteed recurring sales. Okay? The publisher knows that after the book is checked out 10 times, the library is going to need another copy. Okay? Therefore, the publisher is going to earn more revenue. Okay? Um, but let's consider this. What if for example, the students at a school were really very careful with their, their books because the librarian was a mean old witch, like me, um, and their books were not damaged or lost ever. Okay? The publisher would not get more money from the school. However, if this was a 10 checkout um, license, after the book was checked out 10 times, the school would have to, they would be forced to purchase additional copies of the book. So the question is, is it fair for the publisher to decide when a new copy is needed? Amazon currently allows you to lend Kindle books to another reader that you know for 14 days, and then it comes back to you. Okay? The URL for this on the screen um, talks about it, and um, in the readings this week called Reselling eBooks, you'll learn about Amazon's patented method of allowing users to earn money by selling their eBooks on Amazon. At the current time, it has not um, come to fruition, but they do have a patent for that technology. So I guess they're thinking, well, if you can't beat them, join them, they're going to get in on um, a cut of the sales. So the struggle between publishers of digital media and consumers and libraries will continue to occur as technologies develop um, that change how digital rights management can occur. Okay. Um, consider how much, though, the Redigi case relies on an understanding of technology and digital files and file transfer, etc. In that case, there was much criticism of the judge's narrow understanding of file transfer. But if a judge's background is not in technology, how would they understand this? Okay. The government is trying to keep up, but it's always a step behind. Technology is just evolving too quickly. Okay. This is very similar to what happened in the Sony versus Universal Studios case, which is often just referred to as the Betamax case. If you don't know what Betamax is, you need to stop right now and look it up. Okay. And then you'll know how old I am. So um, the Betamax case occurred when a new technology, VCR, allowed time shifting. OK, 
okay? Which was a new way to use technology. So instead of watching the show when it came on at five o'clock, you could tape record the show and watch it when you got home at eight o'clock. Okay, so how is copyright law that was created in 1776 going to keep up? This is the, the issue that we're at right now with digital and first sale. Okay, um, so just be thinking about that when you're going through some of the readings. Okay, um, another if I create something, it's automatically protected by copyright, and no one can make any copies, editations, etc., unless I donate the work to the public domain. I can, of course, grant licenses to individuals, but this is both consuming and difficult to track. This all or nothing approach seemed extreme to some creators. For example, what if I want people to take what I've done, remix it, recreate it, copy it, and send it to other people, but I still want my name attached? This is where Creative Commons licensing comes in. Creative Commons are copyright licenses. Remember that through licensing, a copyright owner can share their rights with others. These are the current six Creative Commons license options. Please refer to the Creative Commons license page to get a description of what each license affords. For example, the Attribution Share Alike license, the one that is marked in red, allows others to, quote, remix, tweak, and build upon your work, even for commercial purposes, as long as they credit you and license their new creations under identical terms, end quote. So how do you decide which Creative Commons license to use? Creative Commons Australia has created a flowchart that helps you choose which license you need to reserve the rights you want to reserve while sharing the rights you want to share. It's linked in the readings. There are also other flowcharts or tools and charts available on the internet that provide comparable information. So in this module, we took a look at licensing. Licensing occurs when copyright owners allow others to use, either for free or for a fee, their works in manners that the copyright owner determines. We also looked at issues that digital products are creating and how they're changing the face of licensing and the possibilities accorded to it.